We're going to begin with our virtual speaker. It's Michael Kugelman, Deputy Director and Senior Associate for South Asia, the Wilson Center Services, where he's responsible for research and publications on the region. He's a leading specialist on Afghanistan, India, and Pakistan, and their relations with the United States. He's joined us before. Uh, Nutshell Group, uh, as most of you know, uh, keeps on organizing various um, physical as well as online events. Um, in fact, we were the pioneers uh, for webinars um, in the COVID and post-COVID times. So Michael has joined us um, in a very important series of webinars which we did on Afghanistan because of his expertise and his very deep insight into the issues of Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, and the relationship between United States and this region. So Michael is the editor and co-editor of 11 books. Uh, he's published op-eds and commentaries for the New York Times, the foreign policy, the foreign affairs, CNN.com, Bloomberg View, Al Jazeera, the Wall Street Journal's uh, think tank blog, and many others. He covers topics ranging from US policy in Afghanistan to terrorism to water, energy, and food security in the region. Stemming from the above, Michael's topic today is the emerging global affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, let put, let's put our hands together for Michael Kugelman. So I've been asked to speak about uh, the geopolitical situation and really the broader uh, state of affairs with the world order today. And so what I'll do in my brief allotted time is to identify what I view as three key trends in global geopolitics. And I will then um, take those three trends and uh, link those to what I see as an opportunity for the U.S. and Pakistan, and for U.S.-Pakistan relations on the whole. So the first big dominant trend that I see in global geopolitics today is what I would describe as the limits of U.S. leadership. We have seen for quite some time, I would argue, that uh, the U.S., which at least at this point in time remains the world's sole superpower, it has really been not leading from the front in ways that it used to. And I think we saw this begin to emerge during the Trump era when Washington uh, you know, deliberately tried to do less in the world and not withdraw from the world, but play a more, um, uh, play a more low key role in the world. And this did cause problems for the US and its alliances and its partnerships. And we saw as a consequence when the pandemic emerged uh, several years ago, the U.S. was not leading from the front in trying to bring together the world on the whole to combat this, this shared threat. And then more recently, with the new administration, with the Biden administration, we saw what can only best be described as a completely botched withdrawal from Afghanistan. I'm not saying that the U.S. decision to withdraw from Afghanistan was an indication of, 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 of less U.S. leadership, not at all. But what happened the last two weeks of the withdrawal, which in which we had a very chaotic situation where it was clear that there was no U.S. plan or strategy for how to deal with the scenario that emerged over those last two weeks after the Taliban took over. To me, that suggested, again, a failure of U.S. global leadership to work with Afghans, to work with allies and partners, with NATO partners to come up with a plan or strategy to make that withdrawal more responsible. It didn't happen. That was another indication of failed U.S. leadership. And then finally, most recently, despite its best efforts through pressure, through diplomacy, through inducements, threats, the U.S. was not able to prevent the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, which I see as, as an indication of, of lesser U.S. leadership. So that's one. The second big um, geopolitical, global geopolitical trend that I, that I um, identify is the centrality of U.S.-China competition. This has become, in my view, the big story for foreign policy these days. Uh, certainly for many years, we had been seeing a growing competition between the world's two biggest powers, the U.S. and China. But during the Trump administration, we, we saw it reach another level, in great part because you had a, uh, an increasingly nationalistic, uh, and I would argue uh, at times provocative, uh, Chinese uh, foreign policy Whereas at the same time in the U.S. with the Trump administration, there was a very hostile confrontational policy being taken toward China. Now, many had assumed that when the Biden administration took office, that the U.S. government would sort of 
dial down that intense competition. Uh, but that really hasn't happened. And it's quite striking that one of the first moves that the Biden administration did, it invited the Taiwanese um, uh, de facto ambassador in Washington to Biden's inauguration. It's the first time that it ever happened. And we've seen in recent months uh, that uh, the Biden administration has taken the same hard line toward China that the Trump administration took toward it. So as a result, you know, we've seen some some recent um, uh, major tensions between the two, and of course the the, the 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 tensions around the Taiwan Strait. This all, in my view, highlights just how dominant U.S.-China rivalry and competition has become, and especially because you're talking about uh, what arguably are the two most influential dominant countries in the world. When those two countries aren't getting along, you really have to be uh, concerned there. Um, and the Biden administration has repeatedly identified its competition with China as its core foreign policy priority. It was one of the reasons why what the, why President Biden decided to withdraw from Afghanistan, because he believed that um, he had other bigger priorities elsewhere, including the competition with China. The third trend, uh, the third big trend that I sense in global geopolitics today is a positive. You know, I've talked about two difficult challenges in global geopolitics, but um, the third one I would identify is opportunities for more global cooperation. I say that because if you look at the, the range of threats, global threats and global challenges today, I would argue that the most salient and most impactful ones today are borderless. Uh, you know, things like um, uh, pandemics, climate change, cybersecurity risks, uh, you know, resource shortages, natural resource shortages. These are, you know, these are threats that so many countries face together. Uh, and in some cases, equally, you know, climate change is something no one, no one is immune from the effects of climate change. And so, in other words, the whole world is impacted by every any one of those borderless threats that I mentioned. So it's unfortunate that in a moment when there has never been a more important time for there to be more multilateralism and global cooperation because of these threats that the world is facing, we're not getting that. But that doesn't mean that it can't be there. It doesn't mean that there can't be more leadership and ways around that. And so that then brings me to the, the, the Pakistan side of this story, and I guess more, more broadly, the, the South Asia regional geopolitics side of this story. You know, as, as, as this audience would well know, the U.S.-Pakistan relationship has been a, a turbulent one over the years. It's had, some, it's had a number of good times and it's had some difficult times. I would argue there have been more difficult times in recent years than good times. I would argue that one reason why the relationship faces notable challenges today is that there are what I would describe as some geopolitical straitjackets in play, so to speak, in the sense that, first of all, um, the, both the U.S. and Pakistan are deepening relations with the other's main rival, right? So you know, the U.S. is ramping up relations with India. We've seen increasing levels of, of defense cooperation and arms uh, sales and things like that in recent years. Whereas Pakistan, which has always been close to China, has been has been ramping up that cooperation as well, particularly through through the CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So that I think imposes some limits for growth and expansion in the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. But I think one of the big questions for those of us that think about the future of U.S.-Pakistan relations and would like to see that relationship succeed, despite the constraints that it faces, is how, do, how can the U.S. and Pakistan operate within those constraints that I laid out? And specifically, how can the U.S. and Pakistan operate within the constraints of U.S.-China competition, right? The conventional wisdom is that there's only so far, there's only so much the U.S. and Pakistan could do because Pakistan is so close to China, the U.S. is so close to India, Washington's main broader Asia policy is the Indo-Pacific policy, which is all about countering China, Pakistan's ally. So that really leaves little room, one would think, for Pakistan to play a role in these U.S. Uh, initiatives and policies in the region. But I would argue we should try to look at this with the glass half full, not the glass half empty, and think about some possible ways in which the U.S. can not only operate even within those constraints of U.S.-China competition, but also look for how the U.S.-Pakistan relationship can be leveraged in ways that 
There can be ways to compensate for less U.S. global leadership and ways to contribute to building much needed cooperation on combating global threats. And here I come to my, my punchline as I begin to, to wrap up. Um, I think the issue of climate change is central here, right? Uh, I think that there's clear buy-in uh, across political parties, across all key entities in, in Pakistan and the United States, that climate change is a huge issue. China, I think, recognizes the importance of climate change and climate change mitigation. I think that we could perhaps look um, to this idea of viewing Pakistan as some type of mediator or go-between the U.S. and China to cooperate more on climate change mitigation issues. Um, now, some may say, well, I mean, the U.S. Is, doesn't have any problems holding in, in negotiations and talks with China when it wants to. And indeed, the Biden administration had said on many occasions that it would be willing to suspend or sorry, it would be willing to pursue cooperation with China in areas where it serves U.S. interest, including on climate change mitigation issues. But two key data points here. One, when the two sides have gotten together on high levels to meet, um, things haven't gone well. I mean, remember that during a meeting in Alaska some months ago, the U.S. and Chinese sides actually got into a shouting match, which is very unfortunate. And then more recently, uh, China has decided to suspend negotiations with the U.S. on climate issues because of what happened uh, with in the Taiwan Strait with Congresswoman Pelosi's visit there recently. This is not good. This is not good. You need to keep those channels open for discussions between the world's two biggest powers and also two of the world's biggest polluters when it comes to the issue of climate change. Pakistan, I think, could could be that 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 entity that could conceivably try to mediate and bring the two together. In that, you know, we know that Pakistan is one of the countries, one of the relatively few countries that has a good relationship with China and a workable relationship with the U.S. Not the best relationship, but it's a workable relationship. We've seen U.S.-Pakistan relations uh, show some signs of improvement in recent months. Uh, so I don't want to say that this is something that could happen immediately or anytime soon. And I do think that in the, over the long game, the U.S. may indeed prefer to engage directly with China on its own and would say it does not need any type of third party mediator. But Pakistan can play that, that unique role. There may be an opportunity here. And I think that is, that is one way to, to think about this, you know, this sort of re, look, look at an outside the box um, solution to this constraint for U.S.-Pakistan relationship, this constraint posed by the limits of U.S. leadership the centrality of U.S.-China competition, and also tap into these opportunities for more global cooperation. So I think my time is just about up, so I will wrap up there. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I wish you all the best for a very successful conference.